<laughs> off to a running start. Um, so yeah, my name is Megan Seiler. I have an MA in art history from the University of Kansas and uh, a master's in liberal studies from the University of Michigan. I did my undergrad in art history and this is a topic that I'm, I'm really interested in. So I hope that um, I can bring something to the table that's interesting or exciting for anyone here tonight. Um, one of the things I'd like to start off with is um, a lot of resources that like a lot of things I'm going to talk about tonight, you can get more information about all of this, um, if, especially if you're a Massachusetts resident, you have access to JSTOR, which is an online database of thousands and thousands and thousands of articles and journals. And um, I'm going to have a, a list at the end of some of the uh, articles that I read and some books that I read that you might be interested in. And so um, please, please, please use that resource. If you're from outside of Massachusetts, your library may offer that as well. So I strongly encourage just asking your librarian because, you know, we pay for all these resources and I, I want you all to use them and, and enjoy. And then I also want to give you a heads up that um, my area of research was late 19th, early 20th century French. And then contemporary art looking at American, especially public art. So that's kind of the lens of which I'm approaching this talk tonight. So I may say some things and, and you might know more about Japanese art or about, you know, North African art where you're saying, oh, but this was going on in this area at this time. And you're, you're, you're probably way more experienced in that than me. And if you want to share those things, please do, because I'm just speaking from my background. So I'm going to miss things. I'm not going to talk about everything. So I just want to give that a little heads up. I don't want to exclude anyone, but also I just want to speak with about what I know. So with that, so tonight we're going to talk about craft, but you know, why discuss craft when there are so many amazing female artists that we could be talking about, right? I mean, I'm giving four examples here. One is Artemisia Genalashi. She is an Italian artist. Um, she, a lot of her work had been misattributed to men for quite a long time until recently. Um, and she's finally getting a solo show. This piece, Judith and Hall of Baronies, is at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I, I'm from Detroit, so I'll, I'll reference that museum a couple times. Um, but they're hosting this exhibition right now. I think it's coming to Washington, D.C. And if it is, you should really catch it because it's like the first of its kind that features her work, but also other Italian female artists at the time. Um, the next is Edmonia Lewis, who was um, half Black, half Cherokee American sculptor. She studied at Oberlin College, one of the first colleges to actually admit women and women of color. She then went on to study in Rome, and she recently was given a forever stamp by the United States Postal Service. Um, her work is incredibly powerful, and she, I don't think she has a solo show right now, but we're hoping as soon that she will, because there's been quite a resurgence in scholarship on her. Um, one of my personal favorites is Camille Claudel. Uh, she's often best known for being the student and mistress of Auguste Rodin, the sculptor who did The Thinker. I think everyone knows that one. Um, and if not, you've probably seen it. Uh, it's a very, very popular sculpture, but her work was often dismissed because of the fact that she was so entangled with Rodin. And she recently got her own museum in France, which I hope to visit someday, but her work is incredibly intimate. It's very emotional and quite beautiful. She also does work with stone and metal in a way that no other artist was really working with at the time. And so if you're interested at all in sculpture, I'd also recommend looking at her. The last artist that you'll see is Helena Schofbeck, and she was a Finnish artist. She did study in France. Um, a lot of Scandinavian artists are not talked about, both men and women. They're, it's not a very popular topic for art history. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is the language barrier for quite a long time. And also they're really protective of their artworks. But Helena Schafbeck is a, a really, really interesting artist who deals with aging. So she does a long series of uh, self-portraits throughout her entire life where she kind of addresses the impacts of aging. It's a very thoughtful, interesting perspective that a lot of artists don't ever touch on. So if that's something that you might be interested, I highly recommend her work. And there's this is just a tiny touch of the surface of, of, of amazing women artists. So I just gave you a couple of tastes in case that's something that you are looking for tonight, but that's not quite what I'm going to be talking about at the moment. But so why are we talking about craft? Well, one of the things that kind of inspired me is that we currently have on exhibit at Wisteria Hearst an installation of doilies by a local artist 
um, Feliz Caibano. And if you've had the privilege of coming to see it, you know how really incredible it is. So she takes hundreds and hundreds of these joilies and she individually nails them to the wall and has them pushed out from the wall where it creates these beautiful shadows that kind of highlight all of the work that's been done on these doilies. And when I've been talking to Felice about it, you know, one of the things she was drawn to is that all of this work is kind of invisible. Like we, we don't know these women at all. We don't, we don't know anything about them. We don't know their stories. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like they, they were doing this work and it was seen as valuable because we, we still have it, right? It's on the wall of this gallery, it's being reinterpreted, but how much of this kind of invisible labor have women been doing that is having an impact on art history in general or just on our visual culture? So that's why I started thinking about instances of, of this happening in the art history world, which is why I thought, well, let's talk about how craft makes its way into art history and how more specifically, women's craft makes its way into art history. And, you know, this is Women's History Month, this is the last day. So why not kind of talk about that aspect? And let's move to the next slide. Oops, too far, Megan. So what is the difference between art and craft? And this may seem like kind of an easy question, right? Like, Art's what's in museums, it's, you know, paintings and sculptures and craft is kind of all these other things, right? And there's a really, really great essay and I have it linked. Um, it's from the 90s, but I don't have it right up from, aha. Nope, not it. But where she kind of breaks down looking at how to discuss art versus craft and really highlights how difficult that job is. So one of the things she does to approach this is looking at the concept of utility. Does this object have a purpose, right? Is it something like a painting that, you know, it doesn't do anything except for exist as a painting, or is it a chair that people use and sit in, right? So if it has utility, therefore it would be craft. And if it does not have a utility, it would therefore be art. But this becomes kind of complicated when you think about you know, maybe a painted blanket chest, right? So it's got this elaborate artwork on it, but it also serves a purpose. Or even if we take the instance of a chair, right? So you have a chair and you can sit at it, but what about a throne? I mean, that's a chair, but it has sculptures on it. It has metal work on it that creates these figural things and it represents stuff. So is that art? Or because you can sit in it, it's no longer considered art. And also to take that even further, if we think about museums and as we walk through these spaces, um, you'll see objects behind glass, right? You'll see a teacup that's been hand painted and an art museum has decided that this object is worthy of being behind glass. And now we've removed it from its utility. So does that transform it into art? If you, if you never use that china, does that make it art because it serves no utility to be anything other than decorative, right? So as you can see, there's a lot of gray when we're discussing this topic. So the next thing she kind of introduces is the concept of skill. Skill exists in both, of, both art and craft. So you can be a very skilled artist or you could be a very bad artist, right? I mean, there's a skill level to art. And then when it comes to craft, when we talk about skill level, skill sort of makes it a little more complicated, right? So you can have a chair that's poorly made, right? It's just a clunky chair, it wobbles, it's not great, it's not made from great materials. Or you can have a chair that you're like, wow, that is impressive, right? And I keep using the example of chair because I think we've all seen good and bad chairs. And I think we can all relate to a chair that we've seen that we're like, wow, who sat in that? Like that is an incredible piece of artwork. Or you've heard the phrase, this is a work of art in reference to something that has utility, like maybe a musical instrument or, you know, maybe a table or whatever it is, or, or a piece of glass, right? A, you know, a cup that has this really intricate artwork on it or etching. You say, this is a work of art because we are acknowledging that the level of skill is so heightened. It elevates the object from just being craft to something that's art, right? So it's not so easy to say something fits into one category or the other. 
And then we have interpretation. Can this piece be interpreted, right? So we have, you know, sculpture can be interpreted, paintings can be interpreted, but what about an object? Can an object be interpreted? Are there things on that object that make it interpretive? And that's something that's a little bit more complicated, of course. So there's ways in which an object can, can operate as both art and craft. And I don't think that we really need to put one in, them in one box or the other really, but complicate this discussion a little bit and try to muddy the waters of trying to categorize or even classify and rank the importance of one versus the other, but to understand really that these two things are communicating with one another. They don't exist in vacuums, they exist together. And therefore it's important to consider both when we're looking at art history. And to have these sort of classes and class systems for how we look at objects and art can be problematic and can actually prevent us from seeing things that are quite important. And so when we talk about that, we go next to decorative art versus craft. And this is where it gets a little tricky as well. So, you know, most museums have a decorative arts department. It's often seen as a little bit less important than perhaps like the French paintings department. You know, there's, there's a level of hierarchy in museums that exists. I don't think it's right, but it's there. And so there's a, a sense that decorative arts are a little bit less than, and then you have craft. So here I have two examples. They're from relatively the same time period around in the 1600s. One, the one on the left is a um, needle point from England. The one on the right is I believe Austrian or Belgium, I can't remember which, but they're both in the collection at the Met. And if we think about needlepoint versus tapestry, tapestries are often on display in art museums frequently. They're grand, they're huge, they're detailed, they're ornate, and they're made by men, right? They're made in these, you know, guilds, they're, they're made by men. These big, impressive tapestries are often for castles or, you know, the gentry. They're very expensive, they're very lush, they're very elaborate, and they're still using very similar materials to what women are using at when they're making these needlecraft samplers or making needlecraft for outfits or for decorative objects in their own home. So why do we dismiss these beautiful elaborate patterns that women are creating as needlepoint and elevating these tapestries? I would argue again that they're taking from each other. So embroidery is taking from tapestry, tapestry is taking from embroidery. Tapestry is also taking a lot from printmaking as well. So there is a communication that's happening across all different elements of art and visual culture. These things are all communicating, they're all impacting one another and evolving us forward with our visual vocabulary. So when we compartmentalize and try to make things black and white or say this is better than this, what we're really doing is stopping ourselves from exploring all of the different things that are going on in society, in our culture that are contributing to really make things that are, that we enjoy, that we want to research, that we want to study. And when we try to make things less than, it really neglects the importance and the communication that happens between these objects. So that's sort of what I am um, kind of discussing about this as we move forward. And I thought a really great example would be collage. So who invented collage? And we have this amazing mythology around collage in our history that Pablo Picasso, this amazing, genius created collage in 1912. And this is his piece, Guitar, Sheet Music and Glass. It is made with wallpaper, um, music paper, newspaper, drawings. It is a multimedia piece, right? It's, it's the first of its kind, so we're told, right? But is that really the case? Was Picasso the first person to really create collage? And, and why is that myth something that we 
accept so readily and yet don't challenge at all. Is it, is, is it possible that Picasso was the only person who thought I should put a bunch of images together on paper? And I would argue that no, he was absolutely not the first person. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. We have then a next, the next important movement that comes with collage is surrealist collage. So this is Max Ernst, and this is the master's bedroom. Sorry, there is a screen in the way. I should controls. But um, the master's bedroom, it's worth spending a night there for the 1920s. So a little bit later than what Picasso was doing. And what Surrealist Collage is doing that's a little bit different from what Picasso was doing was he's transferring these images to create these new scenes. So he's also working with letters the way Picasso was, but he's creating these like surrealist landscapes. And he's using images from um, catalogs, from nature prints. He's painting, he's handwriting, he's adding all of these elements together to create this new scene. And again, this is, sorry, this screen is just not working out for me. This leads me into Victorian photo collage. So this is happening like 50 years beforehand. We have a group of, this is from this sample, gentry in the Victorian era, several albums of these really strange and surreal collages. This is happening before Picasso. This is happening before Max Ernst. These were collaborative pieces. These are pieces that these women would sit together and create. And this is the gentry working on this. Okay, So it's a very privileged class that's doing this. They have the time, they have the resources. And what they're doing is they're taking um, print images that, of popular culture items. They are drawing and painting new scenes and they are including photography. So photography, this is, I think the second generation that has had photography at this point. And what they're doing is they're taking a lot of carte de visites, which are the little visiting cards that were incredibly popular at the time. So if you'd go to visit somebody, you'd leave one of these cards if you miss them or something. People would collect them, trade them, pass them around. Prince Albert shows up in a lot of these. So you have these really surreal images that these women are creating. They're creating these new landscapes. And this is Kate Eutho from uh, 1870s. And as you can see, there's kind of like a Alice in Wonderland vibe here. And she takes these people that she knows or doesn't know in personal life and puts them in these strange, surreal landscapes. And this is one that I particularly love because these two are on separate pages, but they're interacting with one another. So Georgina Berkeley, and, and just so you know, this comes from a book that there's been very little research done on these specifically. It's a very new area, but there was an amazing um, book called Playing with, uh, Playing with Photos, Photographs, The Art of Victorian Collage, uh, or Photo Collage. And it's, I have it at the end of, of the presentation, of course, but this book has so many amazing images. I, I can't share enough. I actually had to go to the Clark and these pictures are mine. So I'm sorry for how not great they are. But in any rate, these two images, Georgina Berkeley is probably one of the most interesting case studies of, of photo collections, but she creates these scenes and these two kind of interact with each other, which is such a unique, wonderful, new perspective. And so if you're an art historian like I was, who had always heard the myth that Picasso was this great inventor of collage, imagine my surprise when I came across this book in the art libraries, I'm doing research on Victoriana stuff, and I was like, wait a minute, these existed? <laughs> these look so much like Max Ernst. They look so much like these like weird surrealist movement, like these amazing collages that I fell in love with with Max Ernst and, and had a hook for Dada. There's all these great collage artists. I had never known that these existed. No one had ever talked about them. And there are several in multiple collections. I think uh, Victorian Albert and the Chicago Museum of Art has some. So it's incredible to me that I've been fed this myth that this existed and nothing else had ever happened before this that created this moment. When in reality, 
people have been playing with these pictures for quite a while. And there's also a really great article called In the Defiance of Collage, Assembling Modernity by Christopher Kersey. And I have that again at the end of the slide, who talks about the resurgence of this ancient uh, Japanese album that was collage. And it became popular in 1898, it was circulated. It was called the Anthology of 36 Poets. And so this article kind of talks about how the discussion of collage existed before, and it was known about long before it was ever created by Picasso. And now, if you love Picasso, I'm not here to tell you Picasso was awful, he was not talented, he was not a genius, because he absolutely was. The things that he contributed, the things Max Ernst contributed to art history are wonderful and incredible. But what I want to acknowledge is that there were other people doing really interesting creative things, and a lot of women were doing interesting and creative things, but because they were doing them in the privacy of their own home, they weren't seen as worthy of discussion by art historians. So what I wanna do is just complicate this mythology. And if you ever hear this mythology of like this instantaneous genius, I want you to challenge it going forward, right? So you hear this, uh, you hear this time and time again, like I think uh, there's another artist, if an artist ever says, you know, I've never been inspired by anyone, this is all my own doing, he's, he or she is absolutely full of it because it's kind of like eating, right? Like chewing is a separate act from tasting, but they go hand in hand. So like creating art, you're always seeing things, visual culture, you can't separate what you see from what you're creating. And it, it's kind of this thing that happens in tandem, in tandem and you're always absorbing things, whether or not you're conscious of it, these things are, are proliferated a lot throughout throughout time. And it's like, you can't just, you can't detract the two, for, the, the, detach the two from one another. They are existing together. So collage existed in the collective visual vocabulary of people long before Picasso created collage. And these are just amazing examples. So even if you just Google the book, a lot of these pictures will come up and they're absolutely interesting and delightful and whimsical and wonderful. And it brings me to how I ended up finding these actually. So I was studying a uh, photographer, uh, her name is Claude Kuhn, she's, uh, or called Cahun, so it's spelled C-A-H-U-N. And she was referencing a lot of Victoriana in her work. And she is actually another female artist that's been incredibly underrepresented. She's super fascinating. If, if you ever have the time, there's a book, again, at the end of the slide, but it's Exist Otherwise, The Life and Works of Claude Kuhn. She's an incredibly fascinating human being and her artwork is fantastic. But these objects that, I, the one I have here on the right from 1937, it's an untitled series. There's several of these. She's taking this bell jar and creating these new scenes, which is something Victorians did a lot. And a, well, I should, I should emphasize this differently. Victorian women were doing this a lot. Right, And if we go back to the doily and this idea of women's labor and the decorative, women were always doing things to make the home, to beautify the home, to highlight their skills, to highlight their creativity. And I like to think that Claude Kuhn was, was doing the same thing in her artwork and, and almost paying an homage to that because she's constantly hearkening back to Victoriana. And it was a very feminine decorative art that she's kind of referencing here with these photographs. So that's how I actually stumbled across these photo collages. I was looking at Victoriana in art history and I, and I found those. And I think it's really interesting to see how artists go back and forth. So just like how the 90s are back in women's fashion, it's like now in this time period, in the 1930s, they're looking back at you know, what their grandparents were doing and trying to understand this like passage of time, reinterpreting these things in new and interesting ways. And I just I thought I'd highlight her work because I just find it really interesting and in how it ties into this Victoriana and and I wonder if that has something to do with Max Ernst looking back at Victoriana looking back at some of these photo collages and, and seeing how he could kind of rework those and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and, and there's absolutely something wonderful about that to say okay this is what they did how can I move it forward so then we talk about cubism so on the, the left is Picasso composition door and key from 1919. And on the right is Harriet Power's Bible quilt. The Bible quilt is from 1898 approximately. 
And you can see a lot of overlap here. There's a lot of shape playing to make, to do storytelling, to, to describe an object. There's no one settled in reality and yet we can still, and by reality, I mean, there's no one on a plane. It's not perspectival in the traditional sense, but we could still read it, right? We can still look at each cell and say, okay, here's what's going on. We know it's a Bible quote, so we can kind of visually interpret as we go along. And cubism is doing something kind of similar, but like I said, it, it, it's kind of reinterpreting this idea and pushing it forward in new and exciting ways. But we often have dismissed quilting and a lot of textile arts because we see them as feminine, as not as interesting, not as impressive. It's not as traditional art form as we've seen, you know, it's, it's art museums like us to believe. And I think it's really interesting if we go to the next slide, on the left, we have Icarus by Matisse, and that was done in 1947. And I have a close up of this quilt by Harriet Powers. And I don't know about you, but I feel quite uncomfortable with how close these two are and how it's almost like he's just straight up stealing from quilting. And, and sometimes that can happen, but I think we should really give more credence to the, the visual impact of quilts and the work that these women were doing. And that's starting to become more and more important as art historians are kind of looking back and saying, okay, let's kind of disrupt this narrative. Let's disrupt the canon a little bit and discuss this a little bit more thoughtfully. You know, quilts were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. I mean, people had quilts, like they were all over the place. There's no way Matisse didn't know what a quilt was, you know? And yet we, we all know Matisse, but we don't know Harriet Power's work. And she's seen as, you know, one of a leader in, in quilting. She's, her work is constantly being talked about in those communities. So why don't we talk about quilting when we're talking about great masters? And maybe we should be, and maybe we should complicate that discussion a little bit further. So now I wanna talk about some artists who, you know, we could maybe, who are using craft in really interesting and exciting ways. And Lenore Twani, she has, really, she did a lot. She died in 2007, but she did a lot to push this concept forward, to really bring craft to the forefront and to really highlight how powerful and visually impactful craft can be. She does a lot with weaving, a lot with macrame knotting, um, knitting. And so, you know, she is one who I, I highly recommend doing more research on. And then this is an artist that's pretty well known. Um, she's from Saudi Arabia. So in Saudi Arabia, she's pretty well known, but um, outside of Saudi Arabia, not so much. But her name is Manal Aldouan, and she does incredible works that really center around women. And this piece on the left is called Sidelines. It's from 2016. This piece is all about Bedouin tribal women. And Bedouin tribal women um, have now been forced kind of into poverty, their lifestyle has become obsolete and therefore they're kind of themselves sort of losing their population. And they do a lot of weaving work that is beautiful and exquisite. So here she's taking that traditional um, Bedouin tribal weaving and creating this new installation and you can walk in the circular kind of like a Richard Serra piece you know you can walk in and experience this piece and thoughtfully look at the weaving as you walk through it and think about women's hands Bedouin tribal women and, and their experiences on the right is um, she did a, a lot of really great photography so this is from a series, a series called look beyond the veil from 2009 so again, she wants to highlight um, women's textiles, but also the women themselves and say like, you know, let's think about what that veil means. Let's pull it back a little, let's pull it forward. Let's have you see women for who they are. And I think that she covers a lot of ground and is a very interesting, exciting and thoughtful artist. So I highly recommend looking into her work if you're interested. Most people know Marina Abramovic, but this piece is at the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Again, like I said, I'll bring it up, but it's a really interesting piece and it's called Carrying the Mill. It is a video that's on loop. It's from 2009. 
And as you can see, she's standing in this kitchen and she's wearing all black, but she's holding this bowl of milk. And it doesn't seem like it's that heavy, right? It's just this bowl of milk, but it's filled to the absolute brim. And as she stands there, she stands there. I can't exactly remember the time of the loop. It's, it's quite long. But as she stands there, you can see her hands get shaky and, and milk will kind of spill off the lid, the lid of the, the bowl that she's holding. And she talks about how the point of it is that holding the bowl of milk is, is not in itself a hard or heavy task, but women have to hold these bowls, philosophically speaking, for everything. Not, none of their tasks are or you know, around the kitchen are that hard or, or that heavy, but when all of them are put together, it becomes hard to hold. It comes hard to hold on to. So as you watch this video of her standing still in this space, the milk just spills out little by little. And it's a really powerful piece. And I, I highly recommend if you can do some research and find it, please do. Or if you're ever at the DIA, go and visit and watch it. Um, but a lot of her work is very, very interesting, but this is one that's not as well known. Orly Genger is, um, this is her piece, Yellow. It's from 2013. It was installed in Madison Gardens Park in New York City. This is all knitting. And she did hand knitting for this piece and she layers and layers and layers and layers knitting. And it's really quite wonderful to see how something that was seen as not sophisticated, not, not something worthy of high art becomes this really beautiful, interesting, interactive piece. Something as simple as knitting becomes this complex installation. And she does a lot of other work and she talks about how it's not really about art versus craft for her, but it's about creating these pieces that really get you to discuss yeah, you know, what they are. What are you looking at? How do you uh, how do you feel when you're around them? And I think that that's really interesting and thoughtful. Then we have Alice Kettle. This is her piece, Spring Light, from 2017, and it may not look like it, but there's some printing on here. But what it mostly is is threading. So she embroiders most of her artwork, and it is incredibly challenging to see that in this image. So if you look her up, you'll see her works are really, really interesting. They're very textured and they really highlight the power of embroidery. And she really takes it from being this craft to this really interesting contemporary artwork. Um, and then we have Talia Tissina Jenny. She is a Native American artist. And this is um, from her series, Hokey Tree, a Hokey Tea from Portraits Against Amnesia. Here she creates a digital image by pulling from archival footage of Native Americans um, from tribes in her area. And she superimposes them and creates this new image to discuss this, this, this almost myth of disappearance, but to really highlight and almost kind of weirdly modernize these images. And her work is incredibly thoughtful and interesting. She has a large body of work. This is just a small sample, but she's a very, very interesting artist that does a lot of digital work. And I highly, again, suggest you look at her. Now, if you're from Massachusetts and you've been to Mass Mocha, you are familiar with Wendy Redstar. This is, um, I don't know how to say this properly, but it's like as absolute gay feminist from 2016. This is her and her daughter. She loves to work with textiles, bright colors and imagery to like really highlight the, the craft that Native Americans hold on as tradition and pass down to one another. She also does a lot of great work with language and with archival images. And if you've ever been to Mass Mocha, you, hopefully you've seen her installation there in the Children's Center, but it's definitely a very sophisticated installation. So if you are in Massachusetts and you can make it to Mass Mocha, I highly recommend that you see her work there. It's so interesting. And then um, lastly, I have this slide, which kind of goes over the different source material that I looked at. So playing with pictures, the art of Victorian photo collage by Elizabeth Siegel. That was where I got all those really amazing photo collages from that I mentioned earlier. And then we have Exist Otherwise, the book about Claude Kuhn. And then one of my absolute favorite pieces that really got me interested in art history was why have there been no great women artists by Lynn and Adler? 
You don't need to go on JSTOR to find this. This is available free on the internet. I highly recommend, if you have not read it, to please read it. It is a groundbreaking feminist essay in our history, and it really highlights a lot of questions and kind of gave me some direction on how to how I wanted to approach art history. Uh, home is where the art is, Women, Handicrafts, and Home Improvements from 1750 to 1900 by Clive Edwards. This sort of highlights the art of homemaking and the detail and, direct, and, and the thoughtfulness that went behind creating a home during this time period, which I think is really important because oftentimes we take for granted all of the labor and thoughtfulness and creativity that go into homemaking that oftentimes falls to women to do. And that in itself is an art form. And then we have the distinction between art and craft by Sally J. Markowitz. That is one of the, that's how I started my first slides off. So kind of looking at her framework of how she defines the difference between art and craft. And then again, in Defines of Collage by Christopher W. Percy, that is the one that talks about the um, Japanese book that was then reintroduced in 1898 to Europe. Um, that was going around. And then we have Cultural Legacies and Transformation of Cubist Collage Aesthetic by Roman Bierd, Jacob Lawrence, and other African-American artists by Patricia Hills. That's just a really interesting article that kind of covers a bunch of different eras and sort of looks at how those, how uh, African-American artists kind of interpreted collage and kind of did new and exciting things with it. I have several, several, several more resources. Um, if you're at all interested, you can feel free to email me and ask for any more. And um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and... Megan, that was great. Can you elaborate on what JSTOR is? We've had a question about that. Oh, great. Yeah, let me stop sharing so I can... Um, so JSTOR is an online database that holds thousands of journals and their articles. So, um, and these are all peer reviewed articles that have been submitted by scholars and they're on a wide range of topics. So if you go to JSTOR, you can search, you know, colonial furniture in America and you'll get a bunch of articles by people that have been peer reviewed that have citations for all of their, their evidence, what their arguments. And, um, and it, it holds, thousands and thousands of these and it has multiple journals so like art in america i believe is on there there's just a whole bunch it's got so many great resources so i highly recommend that especially if you're in massachusetts take advantage of that resource and again if you have any questions i can show you how to use it as well great does anybody else have any questions for megan can either put it in the chat or we're probably a small enough group if you wanted to unmute and just ask that's that would be fine too. Anyone. Great. It's so hard when you prepare these talks because you know you're like you don't know if anybody's gonna have any questions and you're sitting there and the pressure's on and. <laughs> Well, no one's trying to stump you at least. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I'm not getting challenged on things. <laughs> oh, Mary has a hand up. Okay, so I'm just wondering um, what does WISTI have in store um, ahead uh, in regards to this theme? Well, um, that's one of the, the reasons I chose this theme is because of Felice Caivano and she's here tonight. Her installation is kind of what inspired this talk because her installation that's there until April 22nd. So if you're in the area, please come and see it. Um, it's all about women's work and I, she can speak to it better than I can, but we had a, a, a bunch of amazing talks in the gallery as she was tediously installing all of these toilets. <laughs> And I thought, why don't I talk about how women's invisible labor made its way into the art history world? And that led me down to collage. Well, I did go to see it. It really is quite nice. It also inspired me to drag out the stuff that my grandmother had made. Um, you know, a lot of crocheted pieces similar that we all cherished. 
Mick, and we have another question in the chat. Was there any evidence that Matisse did borrow from quilts? It certainly seems likely. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a Matisse expert. I'm, I'm, I can almost guarantee that there's an article or two about this out there because it definitely seems like he was heavily borrowing <laughs> from quilting. Um, I mean, I, there's better people than I. I that was not my area of expertise, but um, I highly, if you find anything, please send it my way. Because when I was looking at the quilts from, you know, Harriet Powers, I was like, this looks a lot like Matisse. <laughs> and I was like, and she was much older. <laughs> so I, I can't imagine there isn't some amazing scholar that hasn't done this research already that is much better than I <laughs> to make the case. <laughs> All right, we have a request for the Michigan equivalent of the Massachusetts J store. Oh. It's gonna test your Midwestern roots. Ooh, my Midwest, <laughs> well, and I went to two of them, so. <laughs> well, I think there's, well, one of the things that Michigan makes available to everybody is it's called Happy Trust. And that is a bunch of archival, it's a big database full of, um, information like archival documents that are free to the public because they've gone past the copyright. And so the University of Michigan spent, uh, University of Michigan, Michigan spent a ton of money creating this Happy Trust. I think it's H-A-T-H-A-I. And you can search tons of historical documents on that database. And so I know that one is free and open to the public. If you are part of the University of Michigan as an employee, you may have access to their databases as well. But if you're on campus, if you're on campus at any public university, you can use any of these resources. It's free to use. You go on one of their computers, you can, and they have way more than JSTOR. They have so many more databases. They get really specific too. And any librarian will be more than happy to talk to you about it because they quite frankly don't get enough questions about this and they always <laughs> wanna share these resources with people. And that's why I always wanna share these resources because you know, if you don't know, you don't know. And you know, I think that uh, I, I, I just hope people will be very curious, even if not about this topic, but about looking at JSTOR. <laughs> Ms. Felice, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I have a quick question. Um, Megan, what was the scale of the Manal Aldawana Al uh, piece? Al, Al oh, the Manal Aldawan piece, the okay. um, sidelines. In other words, compared to Richard Sarah? Well, it was, it's much smaller than Richard Sarah, um, right. but it's still, I think, about eight feet tall. Oh. And I think it's, I think it's around 12 feet wide. So you can walk in that spiral. Mm -hmm. I've actually never seen it in person because she, I don't think she's ever exhibited it in the US, but um, I've seen pictures of people walking it. So it could even be a little bit taller because there are videos and images of people walking through it. It's a really interesting piece. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to look that up. And was it made about the same time? They must be contemporaries or she's a little younger. It's hard to, I don't know. She's much later. Much That's about. from, I believe, 2013 or mm -hmm. no, 2016. So that's when that piece was installed. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure she's kind of borrowing from that concept of walking through the installation. Um, but I think it's really interesting that she has it suspended and it, all of this weaving. And then at the bottom, it's all fringe. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting how it like sort of decompresses at the bottom. It's a really interesting piece. And she has so many interesting, I keep saying interesting, but she has so many powerful works and she plays with a lot of calligraphy as well, which I find really interesting. She, she takes these, um, porcelain birds and has uh, Islamic calligraphy on them and suspends them from the ceiling and really, I'm, I really enjoy looking at her stuff. So I, you know, she might be of interest to you, Felice. <laughs> yeah, she is. And, um, and I don't necessarily, I, I see the link to Richard Sarah, but I think of a lot of other things too, and just walking and patterns and circles and mandalas and all kinds of things and yeah. the other piece was a woven the portrait that side view was that a woven piece too 
well, it's a photo, it's a photograph, but it was a hand woven piece that was put over her face, like over her face, like a veil Got to it. then have okay. that shadowing, sort of like your doilies. <laughs> it was just difficult to tell in the slide and I was, I'm just very interested in the work. So thanks, thank you so much. I think you made so many amazing comparisons that's gonna take us a while for it just to kind of settle, you know, and uh, I'll be back to ask you lots of questions in the gallery. So thank you so much. I'll bring cookies, all right. <laughs> I think Meryl had her hand up to ask a question. Yes, hi, and thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, what came to mind when I saw those Victorian uh, glass cases was Joseph Cornell and how he probably got a lot of ideas from that because he used a lot of his that imagery in his boxes. Yes. And it, it's... You know, that's the thing about art is that there's so many interplays of, of artists borrowing from other artists and, and like you said, pushing it forward. That's really what it's sort of all about. And, and you know, I've, I've worked in both craft, fine craft and art and painting and the, the break between, the difference between the two is always such a rare thing. It's, it's kind of like with pastels and do you call it painting or do you call it drawing? It's like, yeah. And, and, and does it doesn't really even matter. It's, it's, it's how you feel about it and how others feel about it, I guess. But, um, but especially with the craft and the recognition of women, I, I'm really happy to hear this. this uh, and the Gorilla Girls who, who help bring oh, yeah. light on all of this as well. It's just so important that women are represented well in the art world and it's such a male dominated and, and you know, driven environment that it, it's great to hear that, that these kind of lectures take place and, and, and awareness. Of course, everyone who's here is a woman, but that's okay. <laughs> well, my, my brother is here, I have to say. Oh, good. So oh, good. We, have, we have one man here. <laughs> oh, and. We have Matthew here, so we have two men. Oh, all right, sorry, I didn't notice that. I'm happy to see that. But <laughs> here. I, you know, and I think it's really interesting because these objects are clearly important because they've been preserved and passed down, which is how police came to collect them, right? And it's like, if these objects were important, then, you know, why don't we talk about them more? Why don't we talk about these things that women are making and creating? And there's so many instances where women are doing things, especially with um, quilting and fabric arts, Throughout mm -hmm. time, women have been doing these really exciting, interesting things. And it's like, why haven't we talked about this? You know? Right. And one of the things, you know, I don't want to say it's all because, you know, of our gender, right? I don't want to say it's all of that, but it, part of it is because a lot of the objects that were being created were for the private sphere. And part of that had to do with the fact that women were kept in the private sphere, of course. But so it, most of the art, art, art historians and the, and the writers, were men and they're focusing yeah. on men and also on what sells and if the gallery owners are also men it's just the way it was and it was very hard for women to succeed which makes it all that that more remarkable that some did <laughs> well and actually quite a lot succeeded it was just yeah. that we don't talk about them they don't get invited as geniuses into mm -hmm. our art history art history textbooks you know we don't talk about women as having this creation, like this genius moment, this creating this whole new movement. We don't talk about women that way. You Which know? is and why Judy Chicago's dinner party is so fabulous. Oh yeah. She, she puts it all out there. <laughs> and that's what's so great about contemporary art. It really kind of opens up and sort of, it sort of takes away this, this leveling of like, this is more important than this. And this is more important than this, which I really hate about music. Like there's always this, this museum mm -hmm. just shows decorative arts and it's smaller and it gets less funding because it shows decorative arts, right. right? Or, you know, even if you look at like the house museum versus the art museum, like what's seen as having more cachet. And I think, you know, and that's something that you can think about, like, why do we prioritize one or the, over the other? And it's not to say that one is worse or one is, or it's bad that one is seen as better or, or worse, but really just challenging like our own perception of these things and, our, and these objects and to think about, why, why, why do we shove the decorative arts in this tiny corner? You know, like, why don't we talk about this more? And 
to that point, I didn't bring it into my presentation, but I was watching Antiques Roadshow a few years ago and this eye clock came on. It was just this solid eye. And then underneath it had an eye that went back and forth, the pendulum swinging. And all of a sudden this light bulb went off in my head and I was like, oh my gosh, surrealism. It's all about the eyeball. It's all about these floating eyeballs everywhere. And this clock existed at, a, at an optometrist's office. <laughs> it was a mass produced clock. And I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. We are constantly absorbing visual material and it gets reinterpreted by artists. And when we say, oh, they were just these geniuses. They were just, they had this instantaneous moment of amazingness and created this new thing. We're really doing a disservice to say, no, they were savvy. They saw these things. They, they took them in and then they reinterpreted them and created something new and exciting. That's okay. That's, that's wonderful. And I think we should kind of think about how we talk about art history and, and what we include in the discussion and, and kind of broaden that and stop gatekeeping so much. And I think that's why it's so great that we have so many women scholars that are, and so many scholars of color that are coming in and trying to, you know, diversify the canon. And I think that that's great. And I want to see more of it. I don't know about you all, but <laughs> I Megan, love it. One other question in the chat that may be a little unfair to you as a, a newbie at Wisteria Hearst, but the question is whether or not Wisteria Hearst has shown more art than craft. I don't know. I think because we're a house museum, we, I know, when, when talking to the last director, there was a really amazing exhibit about um, textiles. And we invited quilters and other textile artists to display their pieces. And I don't think that there's ever been this barrier of one versus the other at Wisteria Hearst. I think that we've always wanted to, we just want to showcase people doing great stuff, I think, at Wisteria Hearst. And so we've had cases and we've had photography, which is also often seen as a less than art form showcased at Wisteria Hearst. And then not only that, but in the house, we have a lot of really beautiful objects on display. And I, I think those have just as much of a place in our, I mean, we, we do a whole spiel about a couch in our house. So there's, there's a lot that we do that's also looking at the decorative in our own house and, and giving the, that pride of place. So I, I think we try to do our best and, and having a diverse offering. Great, any more questions or comments? It was terrific. I just wanted to say it was very enjoyable. Oh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> I know there was somebody who brought up Felice Blank, and it's uh, Kaivano, and it, she is, um, I think underneath my head, at least on my screen, but she's here, her video's <laughs> on. So you can see- I did put her name in the chat. So, oh, thank yeah. you. I saw it pop up on my screen. So I just, but yeah, but thank you so much everybody for coming. I was so nervous and you all were so kind to me. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> and I have Thank a you for doing it. It was very good. We, thank you. It was very so, enjoyable. Please come and see the house if you can, see the installation. <laughs>